I'm here. Now, how many of you been, went to a fast food restaurant today? Mal, none of you. Mallory had been to, okay. How many of you been to a fast food restaurant in the last week? Okay. At least two people know. It came to us. It oh, came to us. Yes, it was even worse than yes. Just for your statistic, 37% of the American population goes to a fast food restaurant every single day. And every week, it is 87% of Americans go to a fast food restaurant. That counts Starbucks. That counts Starbucks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Starbucks. Yeah. Now, oh, well, no, Starbucks. Now, that's <laughs> uh, which, which brings the question is what is a, what, what's the definition of a fast food restaurant? A very good question, and in one sense, it's nothing new. Uh, for millennia, people have been selling food on the streets. You walk up, you know, get your food, you walk away, uh, and that, in, in one sense, is fast food. There were a whole series of other types of production that were created here in the United States during the early 20th century. One of them started right here in Philadelphia, the auto map. Anybody been to an auto mat down here? Yes. Did you ever? Somebody. There was an exhibit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what? Mike Nichols. Nichols. It was a game. Yeah. 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 I went to one when they actually gave away free coffee. Uh, they stopped doing that because people just went in for the coffee. <laughs> but auto mats actually started here in um, Philadelphia. At least the first American ones did. Was it on the No. no. In this case, it's in. Um, you should, and you should have the exhibit on the near public library. Yeah. All the machines are still there; they're just they've just been stowed away someplace. But I'm absolutely serious uh, because we've got a good connection here with Philadelphia, and um, it's almost a century, a century, so a little over a century. Now. So they began, I guess, 1901. But there were other there were other other fast food solutions too. Another one was the cafeteria. So that's the exact same thing. You walked in, you picked up your food. Already, food's been prepared, and then you go pay a cashier, and then you walk out food if you want, and you go and eat it in the um, And um, there were other types of programs that were developed in the early 20th century. Um, there were some chains that began to develop, and there were certainly some cafeteria chains that went on. There were also chains that began to focus on certain products like hamburgers. White Castle, anybody been to a White Castle in here? Um, there was, I, I, there was no White Castle in where I grew up, and so I was shocked when we started driving around the country and all of a sudden we found White Castles, but that was my first experience with them, which wasn't until the 1950s. So um, I found that interesting. But White Castle, in one sense, will provide a model for McDonald's, and part of it is they had a, they had a specific, initially they had a specific architecture. Every single one had a White Castle <laughs> that, was, that was modeled on the, on the water tower in Chicago, which survived the Chicago fire, uh, fire of, of making this up 1869 or whatever, whatever the actual time was. And so they built it on that to we were real. And they did serve relatively fast food, but technically they prepared the food uh, once you ordered it rather than have it prepared and walk in. Uh, White Castle, yeah, sure. Um, just so you back up, do you? The cafeterias that they start in the U.S. and were they based on like Ford's, you know, auto? Yes. Well, this is an very good question, and, and the answer is uh, there was an American that went to Cuba and went to a cafeteria, which there is uh, not what you think of as a cafeteria. It came back mis mispronounced the name and it was in Chicago, and so the first cafeterias began in Chicago, beginning in the eight. 1880s, 1890s, and then quickly, because the goal was you wanted to, in, in cities, you wanted to be able to feed a large number of people relatively quickly, and you wanted to keep the cost down because that meant more people would come in. And so the principle behind it is keep your costs down, speed up the process, uh, and do everything you can to get people out. So so their goal was you want to come in, and, and there was actually people timing people internal to cafeterias in particular, it was, some, sometimes it was like seven minutes from the time that you got the food, sat down, ate your food, whether you bust your own trays or not, depended on who you were, uh, but uh, it was a relatively short period of time. And, and that's, I think, one of the reasons for the success of fast food in America. Americans, even in uh, colonial times, ate food quickly in, in towns. 
And there, if you read all of the accounts of, of Europeans who came over to the United States and actually went into American restaurants and looked at, particularly in cities again, and looked at what Americans were doing, the amount of time that Americans spent in many restaurants, particularly in big cities, was something like 10, 15 minutes maximum for lunch. And the goal was, again, you, you were in a business, you were paid by the hour, you, were not, you did not get off at lunch, uh, you did not get your hour off, you didn't have breaks. And so the goal was you wanted to get your food, if you which you wanted to get out of your office, or you wanted to grab your food and go back to the office with the food you wanted to eat at your desk. So there were lots of reasons why that's the case. But historically, it was amazing to see the number of, of, of people who came over looked at Americans. So we sat down at a table uh, with 20 Americans, and they had breakfast together. And five minutes later, certain Americans left after they had been served breakfast, and, and other people left. And we were the only ones there after 12 minutes. And so, and so, and so it, just, it was just amazing to take a look that that is part of at least what American city life uh, had been like for a long time. Not so that's one of the reasons. Convenience was the other. Um, I don't know if any of you have had experience of walking into a restaurant and, uh, and an hour later of getting a menu, and maybe an hour after that uh, having the food delivered, and maybe an hour after that actually, well, sometimes you want to enjoy yourself, you want to have a nice leisurely time, uh, but for many, many Americans that wasn't uh, part of the resident. So there's lots of reasons why fast food will come out of the United States in the way that I'm going to talk about it, which uh, to me the model for fast food today is McDonald's. Uh, and you, you had other, as I mentioned my guest, White Castle was a tremendous success during the American Depression. Uh, and it was because it was cheap food. They very wisely uh, placed their, uh, uh, their, their outlets near uh, businesses that were 24 hours a day, like newspapers. And so the goal was you would open up so that you would be open 24 hours a day. And when the workers got off at midnight or at 6 a.m. in the morning, they had a place to go. And workers who didn't really want to take their own food with them uh, for lunch or for dinner or for whatever meal they were having, they could go over, pick it up, and then go back to the place. So newspaper offices and whatnot, all of those tended to be in inner cities. And uh, White Castle began to have problems during World War II. We couldn't get meat. Um, there's a solution. If you can't get if you can't get beef during World War II, what's your solution? Something else. Anybody have a guess what they're going to do? How about an egg McMuffin? Does that sound like a good idea? Egg McMuffins were actually a White Castle invention during World War II when they didn't have meat. They figured out other things. Uh, and likewise, potatoes were not rationed in the United States. French fries had been a part of the fast food menu, uh, but there were real problems. And the main problem with French fries was how do you prepare them? And they had machinery, but the machinery blew up on a regular basis. And if you have uh, relatively inexperienced people working the machine, it could also start a fire. And so, at least during the 30s and 40s, a number of fast food places did try to have but it's only during World War II that they took off, and it's only really not until the 1950s that you have French fry makers that became safe. So you had another criteria that was going along. Uh, what happened to White Castle after World War II is relatively simple. Uh, inner cities uh, had problems with crime, they had problems with uh, other issues that were going on, and large numbers of at least the people who typically gone to fast food establishments moved in suburbs. The suburbs rapidly expanded after World War II, and that will be one of the reasons on why McDonald's succeeded. Another problem with White Castle was they, they did not franchise. They, they made it a choice, uh, and their choice was not to franchise. Uh, in other words, the company controlled and owned uh, every single restaurant that they had. And they would actually go around the country and make determinations of where they were going to do it. They would hire then the uh, operator, and they operated with the staff and they would all be supplied from a single source, which is one of the reasons on why they were able to keep their price down. There were other operations that occurred beginning in the 1920s. A&W Root Beer, which was one of my favorites. And anybody into A&W Root Beer here, at least some of you know what it is. It started on the West Coast. Their goal was something very different. Uh, rather than what you think of as A&W Root Beer, at least what we, we had, you'd go and you get burgers and you'd get the root beer and stuff. And a root beer really just started to 
franchise the, the root beer. That's, that's all they really did. So it didn't make any difference if you were selling chicken or if you were selling hamburgers or hot dogs or whatever. Their goal was they were going to franchise that. And you'd have to pay for the syrup that they would be given. You would then be paid um, a percentage, like one, one or two cents a, a, a glass or a cup or whatever. That's what the proprietor had franchised them. So root beer would then get back to the main company. So that was a second model. There was a third uh, model, um, which they, whether it's fast food or not, but it was the driving. How many of you have been to a real driving? I don't mean the fake things that they have out there now. Uh, yeah, they put the tra they actually put the trays on the outside. They would, you first the important thing was the car hops. Uh, anybody remember the car hops? Uh, they uh, I, in every case that I ever saw. Car hop, the car hop was female, they were scantily clad. Is that, is that a fair comment on it? Um, and, uh, and the reason for that was relatively simple. Sometimes actually they had costumes on it. If you saw, what, what was the name of the movie that they had? It was on in the 1960s. American Graffiti. American Graffiti. Yeah. If you saw that, that was, uh, I mean, they actually had a uniform, they had skates, and, and, and they had, and, and part of the enjoyment of going to a fast food uh, drive in was simply because you just okay. see the local color, I'll phrase it that way. They weren't paid, uh, most of the uh, waitresses were not paid a salary. They were only working on tips. And that will be a problem, which we'll come back to, uh, because it would mean that they would spend more time socializing. And then, because they were relatively attractive and males could drive cars, I know this will shock all of you, but males would actually drive in. They're not particularly interested in buying food, but they are interested in talking about the car hops. The car hops are interested in talking about them. And so it was, it was a, a successful model during the 1930s and 1940s, uh, but it began to lose uh, interest from a large number of users. There were certainly some drive ins, that was another way of dealing with uh, trying to make, meet the needs of Americans, in this case, Americans with cars. And cars became an important part of America beginning in the 1920s. And so when you have cars coming along, uh, you have people traveling from one place to another, you have a business for a pleasure, and uh, you have people driving into communities, and I don't know about you, but we traveled a lot in the uh, cars in the 1950s, and you really didn't want to go to a local restaurant. I know that's going to surprise everybody from the discussion today, but the goal was you really didn't know what, what they were going to serve, and uh, oftentimes, they, in my opinion, they didn't taste great. On the other hand, if you saw a nice fast food establishment that you actually recognize the sign for less than the 50s, 60s, that at least you knew what you were going to get. So at that point they would have <laughs> McDonald's and you knew exactly what you were going to get if you went to McDonald's. And uh, that's something different than what everybody else did prior to that time. All right, so who are the McDonald's brothers? Um, anybody know anything about McDonald's? Anybody watch the founders? Yeah. Yeah. You have to watch the founders. <laughs> it's an absolute must. It costs two two ninety eight on uh, Amazon if you want to go on or are. It's an absolute must if you really want to understand fast food and establish it. And I, my best uh, comment, my, my students are, by the way, watching that right now. I am teaching a class on fast food in New York City as we speak, uh, and I, they can, they're, they're using the camera here to make sure that the students know that I actually was talking about fast food at the time that they were required to watch Founders as a film. So um, all I can do is say, it's a fairly accurate movie, and it's well done. So, uh, the McDonald brothers were born in New Hampshire, and um, it's, it's hard to understand the effect of, of television, not television, of movies, um, and movie theaters on, on Americans during the 1920s and 1930s. They saw movies as the future, and uh, they decided they were going to go to Los Angeles and they were going to get into movies. And, and they went to Los Angeles in 1930, and they succeeded. Unlike so many other people, uh, one of the brothers took tickets at a movie theater and the other one ran the camera. That was their success. Uh, in any case, they made the mistake, like so many other people, of buying a movie theater in 1930. And, um, and the movie, originally, large numbers, a large percentage of American movie theaters actually closed during the uh, 1930s because no one was willing to pay the money to get in. But they noticed one thing was interesting, which others Many others would note the same thing and would be the basis for a number of other businesses in America. But 
one of the things, you make money not on the tickets, but you make the money on the concessions. And the concessions. And um, I mean, uh, I wrote a book on uh, popcorn. You have to write these to difficult books. Uh, and um, the, the popcorn, I don't know if you've been to a book theater later, and you've seen the, the giant tub of death uh, that, that's available to anybody. Uh, the, the total actual cost of the popcorn in that giant tub of death uh, is like five cents. Uh, and and there, yes, there is, you know, there is some supply issues, and yes, somebody's got to sell it. Yes, you've got to have a machine that's going to pop it. And so you probably, if when you really work out the cost of the of the direct cost to the, to the seller, it's probably maybe twenty or thirty cents, and that's the total cost. And so if the if the bucket is now selling for eight dollars, which it is in New York, it's selling for more seven, here, seven, seven or eight dollars. Yes. You can imagine that is where movie theaters today make their profit. They do not make their profit on this. The brothers looked at this and said, uh, "This is where where we can make our profit." And so uh, they began operating in the street, uh, selling snack food ish. Uh, they made enough money because they were around a. Uh, racetrack uh, and people going to and from the racetrack actually picked up stuff. They made up enough money actually to open up a small um, uh, restaurant um, and um, and they they tried to sell chicken. Now, anyone know what the problem of, forget KFC for a second, anybody know what the problem of selling chicken was prior to KFC? No, no, no we're not talking serious problems, we're talking money problems. <laughs> Well, a chicken uh, was, I mean, they're, they're, depending on where you're going to get in, and, and we'll talk about it in a second. But that's not the problem. The problem is how, how do you cook it? Uh, and to cook chicken prior to KFC, it would take you 45 minutes to actually do the preparation on it. So that meant you had to prepare chicken. You had to hope that you were going to get a large number of people came in. If more people came in than what you prepared to do, then, then, then in fact, you couldn't serve them. You have, you have to give them something else. Or alternately, the worst thing that would happen is if you didn't get enough people coming in, then what do you do with the extra chicken that's left over? So all I can do is say those were the issues, and they continued to debate back and forth on that. They made an interesting decision uh, in 1940, and that was they were going to take their six-sided um, restaurant, not, not even, I would say, my best estimate is probably about the size of this one. They were going to cut it in two, and they were going to cart half of it on one truck and half of it on the other truck, and they were going to go out to San Bernardino, California. I don't know if anybody been to San Bernardino, California. All right, uh, San Bernardino, California is a nice transition period for anybody in Los Angeles who was going up to Lake Arrowhead or going up to the mountains, but nobody in their right mind would want to actually stay there, except it has a Kaiser plant. Um, and uh, that was iron and production, and they had a couple other facilities that were that were uh, industrial. So, in any case, they made a choice, and um, and they did okay um, during the war. Uh, sales weren't good, but they figured out how to survive and survive. And after the war, um, they began to see that they had problems. And one of the problems I know this is going to surprise everybody was with the car hops. Their car hops were not selling food. And so uh, the brothers said, is there a better solution to get rid of the car hops um, and, and still make money on this? And their second problem was with cooks, which, by the way, was a problem constantly with all of um, American restaurant life um, from the beginning. And, and none, today we think of these big name chefs and, and so and so as the chef, and they get lots of some visibility. None of that really happened until the 1970s in the United States. And so prior to this time, the chefs were typically, uh, uh, they were uh, working class, typically uh, they drank too much, uh, typically uh, they had other problems with drugs. If, you, if you, anybody read Anthony Bourdain's book, and I won't give it it's too, too sad to talk about. But, but the answer is those were parts of, of the uh, restaurant culture well prior to the time that Bourdain came along. But you've got this problem, and the cooks didn't show up, and then what would you do? You had to get somebody else. You couldn't get somebody else. You yourself was be doing that. And so you got a whole series of problems that were coming up. So the brothers sat back and said, can we create a model that doesn't need car hops, that doesn't need cooks? And uh, and their their answer was, 
American industry. They looked at what American industry had created, it, now called Fordism, but this is assembly line. And the answer is, if everybody just does a single task and is trained to do that task, and it's an easy task so that anybody can pick it up, so that's it. So rather than a chef, all you needed somebody to do would be able to flip the burgers. That's it. You had somebody else that would make the bags. You would have somebody else that handled the beverages. You would make somebody else that handled um, the uh, french fries. So you have a whole series of things that each person does it. It's a simple task. You can learn it very quickly. Uh, and, and they created a system that eliminated car hops, that eliminated chefs, and it was totally inefficient and internal to this. And uh, in 1948, they opened their new operation. And at first, it wasn't very successful because everybody pumped the horns, expected car hops to go out, car hops didn't come up. They were not happy about this. But after a while, what people learned was you could get in line. And what I found in my first experience with there would be 30 people in line, and they and and within a 30 second time of the time you placed your order, 30 seconds, not a minute, not five minutes, not an hour, the way this is some places now, you would actually receive your food on the other side. Now they had advantages, uh, and their advantages was they only had five products, um, and uh, they only had beverages that, that so that, and they had one person who was making sodas constantly, so that there would be a pile of sodas that would be ready, and all you were doing. Was putting an order together, you grab a soda and put it in. There was one person responsible for french fries, that person would be doing nothing but putting french fries, getting, putting them into the bags, putting them on a rack, and then somebody else putting the order together would come and them up. There would be one other person who would be doing uh, the flipping of the burger itself, and, and most of them would be cooked ahead of time, so that all you really had to do was heat up the burger, so you didn't have to cook it from the beginning and worry about a lot of issues with the later problem with the, with those fast food restaurants that are, we, we only use fresh beef in our production facility here. So um, they, they tried that. And then somebody else would be responsible for packing everything up and delivering it. And so a line of 20 or 30 people would be a matter of a few minutes. Uh, you could put your order in, you could get it, and that was what the McDonald Brothers were to create. And they opened that operation in 1948. Uh, and um, they took them a couple years to make make their operation, what they thought was a success. They wrote uh, an article and they got some advertising in uh, a national uh, restaurant journal. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things was one of their products was um, uh, shakes. And uh, uh, do you think you know what a real shake is like? With ice cream? Is yeah. it, actually, it, I have no idea what they put in today. And, and, uh, I, I don't even want to guess. I don't want to guess. Uh, but initially, you had you had ice cream. If you ever tried to make a shake with ice cream, it is not an easy task. And, and one of the things that the brothers found that, that was one of the things that was slowing down their operation. Somebody would come in, and so they had actually hired people to come in a couple hours before they would open, and they only opened for lunch and dinner. They did not have breakfast. They would call somebody ahead of time. They would make. Uh, hundreds of shakes ahead of time. They would put those shakes into uh, a freezer. And so that initially, there would be one person making the shakes, but it's difficult to do because they only had two spindles coming down, and that meant that... So the McDonald brothers saw, saw that there was this guy in Chicago that was making multi-mixers. And multi-mixers, you could actually make six shakes simultaneously. So one person could put the ice cream in and put the flavorings in, another person could be running things, and then you take them off. So at Don Brothers said, we can, we can make a profit on this. And so they ordered five simultaneously. And the guy who was at that point running it was a man by the name of Ray Kroc. Now, Ray Kroc never made it through high school. Uh, he failed at a number of other businesses. He had one success, his wife was well to do. Um, and so um, he had some success there. And one of the things that he, he started working with Dairy Queen. And, uh, Dairy Queen, is this a topic here? Well, Dairy Queen um, was, was another fast food operation. And they, I mean, they focused on ice cream, but they also served other things. And one of the things that they were in, Dairy Queen did beginning in the 1940 was they began to franchise. And so Ray Kroc had a lot of work with, with the Dairy Queen people in order to be able to figure out uh, how to increase the sales of their multi-mixers. And they did a very good job in terms of that. And so when he got this order coming in from California, small restaurant operation, 
numbers were five. We figured out maybe they had five different stores that they were opening and that they were going to do this. And so he, he literally uh, got his car and drove from Chicago out to San Bernardino, California, and sat there, according to his stories and everybody else's, for uh, a day, just watching what would happen. And he was shocked at the number of people that would line up and the speed with which they could be uh, served. And one of the things that's interesting about Ray Clark, he met with the McDonald brothers the following day. One day after he saw this operation, and wanted to franchise their operation. Uh, to make a long story short, the McDonald brothers said, Why? Sure, why not? But we're not going to franchise you with this operation. Remember, the store that they had is six, six doors, it's relatively small. Um, they had been working on a new design, and what they tried to do was create an architecture internally that was the most efficient. So that you could serve it as fast as you possibly could, and their goal was to improve this. And so the design that maybe some of you do remember and that have without without indoor dining, uh, you had to stand up on the outside and you had the golden arches coming out of the building. That was the design that the McDonald Brothers had. But what's important about the story, they never worked, they never operated one of that design. They created the internal working and they made it the most efficient operation that they possibly could. So the people would walk the east, that they would to do the least amount of work that you simplest to ask and they can put that all together, just like an assembly line, just like a board assembly line or other, other efficient operation. So this is what they created, but they never worked. Um, so uh, they, they did sell a few franchises, but one of the franchises wanted to sell chicken. And the brothers said no. So they made them sign this big contract, which now, by the way, I don't know if you've seen a, a, a food, uh, fast food contract that they have that you have to sign. Uh, now it's actually a couple hundred pages long. Uh, and it tells you what you can do, what you can't do, very specifically. And, and the reason is because they don't want to happen what happened with other fast food places. Somebody opened it up, then starts on something. They wanted one image, and they wanted that image to be the same no matter where you were. And that was, that was a very strong advantage in the 1950s and 1960s. So in any case, um, Ray Rock said, OK, fine. Ray Crockett had never opened a, a restaurant, fast food or otherwise. He never operated any of the businesses except for the multi mixers that was in them. He was actually initially looking at it. He would sell franchises and then sell multi mixers to the franchisees. So he would make $950. That was what a McDonald franchise was in uh, 1954. Uh, and then he would make sales of, of multi mixers. But the more he got into it, the more he concluded that he could make more money on the franchises than he could on the multi mixers. And so he started to turn it over. One of the things that was changing in America at the time was demographics. And uh, again, Americans were leaving inner cities. They were going to suburbs. And the problem with suburbs was there's no food available in suburbs. There, there's, there's not in Disney. There's no, there's no grocery stores. There's no supermarkets. There's no restaurants. And none of the things that you would typically have in inner city that would have pretty easy access would you have in the suburbs. And so Ray Kroc would fly over communities, see whether they were constructing houses, and say, "That's I want to buy that property down there. McDonald's the, one of the largest property owners in America. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, this is the way they operated. And every franchisee that he had, uh, he then made a profit on what they sold. Uh, and uh, Ray Kroc became very efficient. Needless to say, he and the McDonald brothers did not get along. Watch the mound if that's an accurate portrayal. And McDonald Brothers, uh, for what, whatever reason, I'm not sure, but they disliked him. Uh, he disliked them. Uh, he, they had never operated in the architecture that they required him and everybody else to do. He said, if you're in the East Coast, you need a basement. Uh, you got cold weather out there. You got a problem. Uh, and so, to make a long story short, he bought out the McDonald Brothers. 2.8 million, which doesn't sound like a lot today, uh, but was um, a lot of money uh, in uh, 1960 when they bought it out. And the McDonald brothers uh, to the that they one, one, one would survive for another 30 years after that government died. Soon, but well, they had a good one, uh, and so they were very happy. Uh, but uh, they created the model that only if, if Ray Kroc hadn't come along, my suspicions are no one would have heard of McDonald's today. So, whether you like Ray Crocker or not, for other things that he did, he will have created a business that uh, now employs 2.1 million.
million Americans McDonald's hamburger that is the fourth largest sale of food. Now, just for your information, I just want you to know, today, Americans spend 37% of the money prepared food outside the home on fast food. And if you think that's high, I can tell you what the shock to me was, France is now 51% of the food money spent outside the home is in fact on fast food. So all these images of this wonderful France, all I can do is say, they have McDonald's down there, they, have, you know, they, don't, they don't have quarter pounders there, they have other names for them, but they really do have a whole series of other fast food establishments on their own. Red Clock comes along, looks over America, makes his decisions, um, and creates a, a company that uh, will provide the model for virtually every other fast food chain in America. Among the, there's now a score of large companies. Um, all of them will follow the McDonald's model. Uh, at least initially, they will follow the McDonald's model. And, and for instance, the people who will create Burger King, they, they literally do exactly what Ray Kroc did. They will go out to uh, San Bernardino, they will take one look at the operation, and they go back to Miami, and they try to do the exact same same thing. Uh, Carl's Jr. is that name, Ray Bell, anybody here. Uh, Carl actually was a Southern California person. He actually had an operation. He was selling chicken. Uh, and so he took one look at the McDonald Brothers and said, we're going to do the same thing as Carl's Jr.'s that he will create. Um, and you have other things going along that uh, make some sense. Um, Kentucky Fried uh, Chicken with the Colonel. How many of you have seen the Colonel? Um, all, all I can do is say, um, I did a speech on food, just for information. It happened to be in Kentucky. It happened to be uh, that uh, the governor was the person who actually bought the franchise from the colonel, and so he gave out Kentucky Colonel passes. So I'm, I'm as much a Kentucky Colonel as uh, was uh, the Kentucky Colonel. So I have, the, I have. My wife can tell you I've got the certificate. I'm a, I'm a Kentucky Colonel. He never served in the military, but he did receive this honor from the governor of Kentucky. So, um, in any case, uh, so in the founders, as if I remember it right. They sort of implied that Ray Kroc made his money on renting the spaces, the real estate part of it. He makes money on he made money on, on two different things. I mean, one he franchised, so so he he is the one who actually did the franchising. So franchisees make money to begin with, and I I know I don't know I think it's now at least a uh, two hundred thousand dollars if you want to start. I don't know the exact figure now, but it's a huge sum of money if you want to franchise in McDonald's hamburger. You have to pay that upfront money. Then you have to pay the company money as they go along. And in this case, he bought the property, which is why McDonald's is one of the largest property owners in America today. And the answer is that he charged the rent. So, so you get money three different ways. Uh, and one of the reasons on why this is so, it, it works. It works not, did not only work for him, but it worked for the later on shareholders when they began to offer stock. I mean, it makes it a profit, and it makes profit for the franchisee, and uh, it provides a service that local communities want. So you've got all of these different factors that contribute to it. But uh, there's, there was the colonel in uh, Kentucky, uh, and I must admit, the colonel was selling chicken. Does that surprise anybody here? <laughs> uh, and uh, he failed. He, he's another one of those, like Ray Kroc, that I don't think he made it into high school in his case. Uh, but he did have a restaurant. The problem was when um, highways were constructed, they, they were not constructed in front of his uh, restaurant uh, and, and a gas station that he owned. And his business went, up, went out of business. But he figured out he had the solution to making chicken. And he did. How could you make chicken and not have to spend 45 minutes doing it? It's called a pressure cooker. Does that shock everybody here? He, he got the time down for about 15 minutes that you could actually take the chicken and put it in. He franchised the chicken. He did not any of the things um, that we think of as KFC today. So he'd go around the restaurant, he would make some chicken for them. It uh, has a secret sauce on the outside. Any, any chemist will tell you exactly what it's in. There's no such thing as secret sauces, but they like to advertise them. You them in that way. And, and he would make a penny on the sales of, of X number of chickens. And so he did okay on that. Uh, and he ran across a person who will be Jake Brown. Jake Brown will come in and take it over and say, all right, you, you got to do exactly what McDonald's does. And that is, you got to have an operation, you got to sell certain things, you got to have a certain architecture, you got to have exactly the same things as they are. And it will be Jake Brown that will be the Ray Kroc of KFC. Uh, and they will rapidly expand across the country too. 
So you've got virtually everybody taking a look at this and, and then duplicating the model. Low cost, highly efficient, it's convenient. Uh, I don't know if any of you travel on uh, the freeways or expressways in the country, and every exit will have at least three or four fast food operations. Um, and by the way, maybe 33% uh, of Americans who consume fast food today, lots of them just go through a drive through There were no drive throughs at the beginning. There were no indoor dining. It is Burger King that takes a look at that, so we need an indoor dining. And, and if, if you've been in Florida, in Miami, in the summer, and tried to, try to eat in your car, uh, <laughs> it's not the most pleasant thing in the world when, you're, when your air conditioner literally loses the ability to cool things down after about 15 minutes of going. Uh, so they create that, and, and that is now what McDonald's will take one look at that, and they will do the same thing. The Burger King, the Big Burger, I don't know if you've ever been, I'm sure you've seen Burger King, even if you haven't been in there. The Big Burger down there, their goal was to create something different than McDonald's. McDonald's was 15 cents. That was the that was the burger. And as a child, I can tell you the burgers tasted terrible, even as a child. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the good news was their french fries were incredible. The story come back to, uh, and their, sh their their shakes were incredible, and and of course we were typically given soda was not available to us on a regular basis except when we go out, but you could go out and get a, a, a large Coke or a, or a large root beer or a large Seven Up or something equivalent to that, and so for us who cared about the burgers, go for the French fries and go for the other things that you had down. So McDonald's learned by looking at. Burger King is they needed something, and their solution was the Big Mac. And so you begin to have a, a, an industry that feeds off itself, that begins to look at what others are doing, and will do everything they can to create something that will be competitive. And that industry has succeeded. Today, in the United States, there are 240,000 fast food restaurants. Uh, and I mean, fast food defined as McDonald's, not as street food, not as food trucks, not as cafeterias, not as all the other things that you have down there. So you have a massive number, and um, their advantages are several. They provide food relatively quickly, not 30 seconds that, that once uh, was available at McDonald's, because they now have 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 products that they're trying to sell. And how they can how they can actually operate, I found that amazing uh, with the short time frame that they have uh, is something. But they constantly are making changes. Indoor dining was one, as soon as, as soon as McDonald's did it, then virtually everybody else had indoor dining. Uh, and then you had drive through now, drive crews had been there since the 1940s in some places. Uh, but they weren't popularized. But as soon as the car culture in America took over, beginning in the 1950s, people saw that the future was in a car. Whether you were buying food that you're getting off the interstate or uh, and then traveling around um, and eating the food, or you're going to work or picking up coffee or whatever, uh, and you were headed in, whatever the solution was, those were things that they did. So in my, um, I mean, I could talk for hours on any of those things, I'm more than willing to have some more questions, but it's an incredibly positive story about how things could be given and have that change today. The amazing, uh, a couple more amazing things before I get into the negative side of it. Uh, the amazing thing is I understand how McDonald's uh, and other fast food operations would succeed in the United States. I don't have any I don't have a problem with Canada. I mean, you know, those Canadians are kind of like us. And so it might work. I can see how it might work in the UK. Um, what's shocking to me was, was the rapidity of fast food operations moving out of the United States and then first into Europe. Um, when I lived in Germany in 1964, there was no, there were no McDonald's, there were no fast food operations, with a minor exception. There was a and W group here stand in Heidelberg uh, that run by Germans, um, and I don't quite know how that got to be the exception of it, but there was nothing like that. And within a matter of a decade, there were McDonald's all over the place, including France too. So you've got this. The real shock to me, I can understand Europe, many of the people in Europe have the same interest, they want communities, they want speed, um, they wanted low cost. I mean, those are the factors that any inner cities would be a factor. Anybody traveling in cars, those would be factors. The shock to me was the development how fast food could operate. It is not inexpensive. It is extremely expensive because there's so many uh, alternatives on street food that will be much less costly. So today, um, all of fast food uh, 
giants in the United States do not look at the United States as an expanding market. And some of them are, in fact, contracting. Uh, they are looking at developed countries as their number one target, and they are rapidly expanding there. And the reasons are so different than what you think of. Because they're expensive, why would people go in a developing country in order and the answer is they like modern, the modern so, idea. It's, it's America. They want to be part of America and they can eat McDonald's hamburger and have part of America. And needless to say, as they moved into other countries, they had to change the menu. You really can't sell beef in India. Um, you can't sell pork in uh, Israel uh, or in Arab countries. I mean, but they, and they've learned very quickly how to adapt their model. So it didn't make any difference. Go into a McDonald's hamburgers, they will in uh, no longer hamburgers. McDonald's operation in India, they will have things that look like what you think of as McDonald's, and they have a lot of wine and local food. So they've given local uh, groups things. Yeah. When when McDonald's opened its first unit in Moscow, yeah. the Soviet Union, it, it was, it was, it was the largest, expensive. It was the largest McDonald's in the world, but and for a year they had there were it was lined up. People in Russia wanted to go have a burger. This was very way, expensive, but the, the extremely attraction expensive. for people, as I understood it, was that, that the servers would smile at people and say, <laughs> "Have a nice day," which they never got. <laughs> uh, my wife is <laughs> Russian, and, and she has had good <laughs> experience in Russia, so she would be delighted to comment on the <laughs> unsmiling, unsmiling uh, people in restaurants and things of that sort. And I had my experiences there too. So, but that's absolutely true. Dan, that when that restaurant open. It was the largest McDonald's in the world, and they had something like 4 million people go through it in a, in a period of year, which is incredible. And, and people would line up. When are we going to line up for McDonald's? Or maybe we're going to line up for 50 or 100 people in a line. Uh, likewise, when the McDonald's opened up at one of them, there were literally tens of thousands of people, and when that one opened up, I'm making this up, 1967, I think, um, but it was the largest McDonald's in the world, four floors. Uh, they could serve something like four or 5,000 people, some things, and it was huge. Uh, some people in Italy didn't like the idea, uh, and uh, there were counter demonstrations, and those counter demonstrators would be what would create slow food. And so they would look at this and say, this is an Americanization of Italy, we don't like that, uh, and we don't want fast, we don't want fast food, no matter what it is, except if it's Italian. Italian fast food's okay. Uh, we, want, we, only want, we only want slow food or, or Italian food. So, so you have that model that will create the antithesis, which I think is wonderful because the person who created it was a Marxist. Uh, and so we have the synthesis, we have the antithesis, and now, now we have um, something new that's coming along. And of course, the slow food movement rapidly expanded, first in Europe and then in the United States. So there, there was, and, and their concern was homogenization. I mean, and that is indeed what fast food does creates a global uh, uh, culinary system. And the system isn't just the food that they serve, it's the suppliers that they have, which is another uh, major problem with fast food. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s, the, the uh, meatpacking industry, the slaughterhouses, were some of the high, most highly laborized sectors of the American economy. Um, and within a matter of 10 years, as fast food demanded hamburger in particular, uh, and, the, and all of a sudden, those who were operating uh, and producing saying that if you wanted to get a deal with McDonald's, which you're going to be selling millions, tens of millions of pounds of hamburger at a lower price, uh, but because you're selling at a volume, you can make more profit. The exact same reason on why fast food succeeds from a financial standpoint. Then what you need to do is you need to cut out workers and not give them the pay, and you need to the rapid line of slaughter uh, and meatpacking. And so, so, as far as I know today, there are no meatpacking operations in the United States that are in fact laborized all over the box. And what the companies would do is they would just close down an operation, open another one uh, a few miles away, or alternately close it down and wait a month and then open up a whole new operation with a new name and with a new corporate entity. Uh, and the sure of it. And uh, again, I, I'm sure you've read all of the articles that are available on the problems internal to uh, meatpacking today. The companies have doubled the line. It used to be uh, 400 cows an hour would be slaughtered in a, in a meatpacking. 
now it's up to a thousand. And so when you speed up the process, you need more injuries, uh, more health issues, um, and, uh, and potentially a lot of problems with regard to illness. And, and that is what um, uh, will, issues that will come out. Why do fast food operations have problems with uh, fast food more analysis? And, and the answer is in large part because of the meat industry that supplies them with the food to begin with. If it's got a problem with you know, food more analysis and you don't treat it properly in terms of your restaurant, then you're going to large number of operations to do that. Um, McDonald's has gotten around that, as I've said before, the process is they actually cook the burger before. So the, when the burgers come to McDonald's, they're already cooked. Uh, and then all you gotta do is just eat them up. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a different process, and at least in theory, it's a safer solution, uh, but they still have problems. So, so that's an issue. That we all know the labor issues that are problems with. Meatpacking industry is a whole number of fast food as well. Uh, large numbers of people who work in meat packing industries are uh, undocumented and if there's a, if they have an injury, uh, they don't report it. Uh, and because if they do report it, they could well have problems with their own um, identification uh, and their presence in America. And so uh, you have low cost people that are coming in that may not be documented uh, that uh, if you want them to work over time and not have to pay them over time, you can do that. Um, all sorts of things, the labor issues that are there, and are relatively well. Eric Schlosser came up with a great book uh, on, uh, on looking at fast food industry in 2001, and, and those are the problems that have decreased to an extent since then, but not long. So those have been problems. Uh, you have environmental problems, and it's not just environmental problems with regard to concentrated animal feeding operations. You have to have huge farms in order to be able to supply the meat uh, for the fast food restaurants. I don't know what you got. <laughs> When you've got 250,000 restaurants, most many of which are selling hamburger or something like that, you got to supply them, and so consequently, you have massive amounts of, uh, of work that uh, that has to be done. Uh, and in the midst of this, um, you've got all sorts of issues that are coming. Uh, so you've got concentrated animal feeding operations that feed the meat packers that, that create the food that is going into the fast food operations. Uh, other issues, uh, there are certainly litter issues. Again, I know that you have no litter problems here in, uh, in Philadelphia, but all I can do is say we have a problem in New York. Uh, and, and a lot of it's faster if you look at I don't, I don't know why. I guess uh, people don't feel the same way. I mean, virtually all the food is packaged already, and so uh, if you're eating indoors, you can just leave it on your table. But by the way, I, I do go into fast food restaurants and Curiosity is not just the new products. Curiosity is really looking at the people who are there. Uh, and uh, it's certainly, historically, was a rapid increase in children. And uh, uh, and that I blame Willard Scott. Does anybody know Willard Scott, the weatherman? Uh, the weatherman. Uh, he was a weatherman in Washington, D.C. And when the McDonald's initially focused just on, on uh, suburbs. Uh, and it was Washington, D.C. that actually opened up the first franchises on the inner city. And uh, they hired Willard Scott to say, we've got to promote this in some way. And so Willard, Bozo the Clown was a hot little number. Did anybody remember Bozo the Clown on television? He was a little hot number during that period of time. And so they tried to create a character that looked like Bozo the Clown, um, and, but wasn't Bozo the Clown. And they, they wanted to call him Mac. Mac. Um, in, in the end, that it was somebody else who was already Mac, somebody rather than Washington, D.C. So they ended up with Ronald McDonald. Why, I don't know, but that was what Willard Scott came up with the name. He came up with the cost. Um, and so then he demonstrated that, and what, and that then rapidly expanded because it was among the first, in 1965, it was uh, in the New York City Thanksgiving Parade, Macy's Day Parade, uh, Ronald McDonald marched down, uh, was it Fifth Avenue? Fifth, Fifth, Avenue. Fifth Avenue, and was became huge visibility. Uh, and all of a sudden, every every other McDonald's operation in the United States needed to have a Ronald McDonald. And why? Because it brought in kids. Uh, and why were kids important? Because um, because they brought in their parents. And if you had a cartoon character initially, that was they had they had no no fat, no no uh, kids meals, none none of the other things. And it was only when McDonald's saw that their main target 
from 1970s on were children. They would advertise, they would target them, they would bring in the parents, <coughs> they would sell, make a profit on the kids' meals, and at the, <coughs> excuse me, at the same time they would make a profit on sales uh, for other people coming in. Uh, and, uh, and therein lies a concern. Large people raise the issues of children being targeted. Uh, it wasn't just the advertising that was on television. I don't know, probably not if you've been on the internet to look at the advertising that goes on targeting. At least on television, there are regulations they're required, but you can't violate the law and, and their laws. There are no laws regulating advertising on, uh, on the internet. And so as most kids have access to the internet without parent supervision, most of us didn't supervise the kids when they were watching TV, or at least you had a better chance of doing it. But now when everybody has their own little laptop or their own little uh, whatever it is to get them into the thing, they can actually do this and so there's massive advertising and children have been so uh, there's been lots of issues, and I can talk to you for hours on uh, labor issues. There are lots of issues with regard to environmental concerns. Uh, personally, I, I really do fault uh, the fast food industry for targeting children. I think mean, that's uh, something we should not have done, but as one person said, they're getting young and they keep them as adults. That was part of the issue. Uh, and there are lots of other issues that were uh, connected with this. Uh, now, nutrition being one. How many of you know and think that fast food restaurants serve uh, bad nutrition? Uh, bad, bad nutrition. Uh, bad nutrition. Uh, they sell high in salt, high in sugar, and high in uh, saturated fats. I mean, this is that's where they make their money. The, the companies have done the best they can. In New York City, there is no requirement that you actually have salt uh, on your label. Salt. And they are trying to <coughs> reduce their salt. But the problem, very simply, is you people who go in there want the salt. Uh, and so the second thing is they, they've done the best they can to reduce the sugar, but people who go in there want the sugar. Uh, and likewise, the soda industry, which as you may know, has taken a real dive. They've done the best they can to reduce the sugar. In, in 2016, they proclaimed that they were going to reduce the amount of sugar calories in their, in their soda beverages by 20% by 2030. <coughs> And I just want you to know that after two years of their operation, they have been able to cut it down to one calorie per person in the United States, so per day. So uh, that was the success that they've had so far. They've got a long way to go. For the fact that really, people want to share. Yeah. They cut it down by one calorie? By one calorie per person per day. Uh, so that includes people who don't, don't buy the product. So you can look at that and say, that's an, they, they've done some progress, not enough. So you've got problems with nutrition, uh, but how many of you think that your local diner and your local cafe is better in terms of nutrition? Mm -hmm. Studies have been conducted. They have compared food served in fast food with fast foods at your local restaurants, and I'm sorry to say your local restaurants have more calories in them, they have more salt, they have more sugar, and the reason is because that's why you go there. You don't go there to taste who wants to go there and have vegetables without salt? Uh, I mean, who wants to go there to have you know desserts without sugar? I mean, nobody wants to do that. So I'm sorry to say we're the problem, uh, not us, but there's other people out there, uh, and and those things. As I said, I can talk for hours on nutrition at the moment. Um, there's some good progress that companies are making, and I've been a little facetious on it, but they are they haven't learned their calorie content of food. They've been doing the best they can. To alternatives for kids, so that they, many of them now uh, are serving uh, veg, fresh vegetables, and some and some uh, trying to do the best they can to serve other things that are nutritious. Uh, the trouble is kids don't want them. And if you walk into a fast food restaurant and you see the mother gets the product for the kids that's got these nutritional items in it, and then you see when the kid walks away, you can see the nutritional items remain there in the table before, after they leave and they come out. So, uh, it's, it's not an easy task. That said, the fast food model uh, has now rapidly expanded, not only throughout the world, but also in the types of products that they're serving. There are some really s small chains at current time that are trying to do good things. Uh, so vegan, vegan fast food. So, I mean, the goal is efficiency, speed, uh, their prices low, but they're doing the best they can to serve food. They're doing, uh, other places are nutritious, trying to be nutritious, they're looking at that, and they're trying to expand it. But, um, standpoint of uh, where America is today. There's no reason why those experiments shouldn't have some success. So we can 
meet the needs of people with mental illness and that's it. Uh, and uh, as I said, I can talk for hours. Um, I've talked to Warren right now. Questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. You said something about the French fries. Yeah. Uh, the, the McDonald's French fries were different than any other French fry operation, and and the part of it was in San Bernardino. Again, no, you, know, you haven't been to San Bernardino, but you don't know. It's within about thirty miles of the Mojave Desert. It is uh, warm during the summer, and it's not that cold during the winter. I'll phrase it in that way. And so what the McDonald brothers did was they bought their potatoes. Uh, and they put them in their back where they had a storage area that was open air. And it, what it did was it created a different type of, of potato, even though the potatoes themselves would be sold naturally. This, because of the process that they were going through, was different. Uh, and then they figured out uh, that uh, Americans didn't really care about the French fry itself, which has virtually no flavor um, and, uh, and it has no, no nutritional component other than calories. Uh, and so they they figured out a way to serve them quickly, and that's it. When Ray Kwok tried to do the same thing with the exact same type of uh, potato, he failed in, in Illinois. And so he spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the problem was. And uh, in part of it, he figured out that it, uh, because it was cold climate, that they couldn't get the same dryness that they needed to have it. And so, uh, but he did go and finally create an arrangement with a potato manufacturer in Idaho potato producer in Idaho um, that uh, actually began to produce a different type of uh, potato so that they didn't have to go through that stage. And of course, uh, as you may well know, it isn't just salt that is on um, French fries. They also have sugar. I know this was shocked all of you. Uh, but uh, that's a, they put the sugar on the top, which is, again, our flavor <laughs> enjoyment. Uh, so it's salt, it's fat, which you get from the frying, and it's sugar that they put on this plate on the outside. For a long time, uh, McDonald's used beef extract as their frying medium. <coughs> uh, vegans heard about this and then bitterly complained um, and took them to court and said, you didn't tell us that this was a, a, a non-vegetarian, a non non-vegan food. Uh, and, uh, and actually, McDonald's paid them off $8 million, which went to vegetarian vegan, which reportedly went to, there was complaints about where it actually went, but, but they did give money and they they got them off the back, and then McDonald's stopped, stopped using that. But other, what surprised me is that other companies continued to use that, and, it, and it's that beef that also gave the, the frying medium that actually gave the McDonald's uh, initially the flavoring that what they were then able to use. And other companies still do that, but as far as I know, Burger King still uses that, or they use meat products in terms of what they're doing, and they don't advertise it, so why they haven't been sued? McDonald's is big. Everybody likes to sue McDonald's. The lawsuits all over the largest, longest uh, lawsuit in, uh, in uh, British history <coughs> was McDonald's uh, that sued that sued two people who, well, right, six people who uh, from Greenpeace who complained bitterly and said that McDonald's burgers were coming from um, farms in Central America and in South America, which in fact they weren't the hamburger was. And so McDonald's sued them, but, and after years they got the worst publicity. It was, they won the case. It was the worst PR stunt that they have ever pulled internationally, and they now just pay off somebody rather than worry about it. <coughs> so, so you yeah. talked a little. Okay. Oh. Um, I covered the fast food industry uh, for the Wall Street Journal in Chicago about 50 years ago, late 60s. And uh, the, the, at that time, I mean, Burger King was there, McDonald's, of course. Uh, the, the, as I recall it, the, the big uh, thing that meant the, the fast food companies was buying up the uh, most desirable intersections. Oh, yes. The real estate locations. It, 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 McDonald's. But once they had those pinned down, they thought they'd be on the easy street. They're, they're, they're McDonald's success, mm -hmm. and uh, the others that followed that was you needed to figure out the right place and, and, and again, once, if, what, if to the extent that you target suburbs, I mean, why do people move to the suburbs and have to have families and have kids? And so the kid connection, as soon as that became obvious, that was another thing. And inner cities, that was the problem. How do you move on the inner city? Um, and, and you needed an indoor dining. You can't have just outdoor dining in an inner city. And so consequently, they had to make a whole series of different things that would then make it possible to succeed 
uh, in Chicago or New York or other places. New York kept McDonald's up for decades. Um, they did it through zoning laws and they played all sorts of games and having taxes and whatnot. Um, and it hasn't really done that well in New York City. But if you go across the river in New Jersey, they're all over the place. It's location. But, but why? Because people drive their car into New York now. And, and if you're coming in for breakfast, you just go to a fast food place, get your breakfast, eat it. As you're waiting in the line for your cars for the next half hour, 45 minutes, trying to get across the Hudson. So, so there's lots of reasons, but that's absolutely true. Location, location, location. Yeah. And that, that was that's so absolutely true at that time. It, it was not only to, to get a good location to pre prevent your right, your competitors, yes, from from buying up that location, and, and, and even that, if you didn't want it. You, you. But I found that uh, I wrote a book on uh, drinking in American history, and All what right. I found was. Bars did the exact same thing. Their goal was, I mean, you open up a bar, you, you were a success at it, but the goal was you wanted to prevent other bars from opening up across the street. And so you did exactly that. You had a bar, you had, you had three or four bars on the same corner. You owned them, but you had slightly different names on them. One would be an Irish bar, another one would be for Marlins, another one would be for Germans, and whatnot. And so the answer was, I was shocked that they, in fact, were smart enough to figure out exactly that location mattered and that they that placement mattered and you didn't want somebody competing with you immediately across the street. We're down the block it mattered less. Uh, but that was that was certainly an issue. And it's certainly huge. Uh, profits are made on interstates uh, and uh, exits on important food courts though. Where everybody goes because you got most of the Many of the food courts that I've been into, maybe it's different here. They don't. They don't have fast food. Um, they, they they may have one or two, but I mean they have. They are serving fast food, but they're not. They're not the chains. Um, and um, right, there are some exceptions um, that uh, I've seen. But in Maine, there are little mom and pop operations that that. Uh, that but food courts are unfortunately going out of business as are the malls. Do okay. you have one here? Have you seen the new food court at the Boers? Just opened, I think. This today. One. I'll go down. I'll go down and take a look. And today is the day. Today is the open day. All right. Speaking about today, I just want you to know that why am I here today? And that is, I want to identify tomorrow uh, as the most important calendar day. It is National Fast Food Day. So I just want to make sure that all of you go out and at least sample so that you can enjoy a little of the fast food. That's, and now you have the history. You can walk in and start telling them what's really happening. Yeah. Well, what, what's astonishing to me is that McDonald's has prospered and flourished all this time, even as tastes have really uh, become much more sophisticated. Howard, Changes in different. Howard Johnson went out of business because of yeah, but, but Howard Johnson but, didn't change. I mean, they had the 31 flavors of ice cream, which I know. So we yeah. would go there and get those ice cream. Who cares about the rest of the stuff? What? The fried plant. And, and they had fried plant. And they actually had a couple other things that, that were actually good. But they didn't change. McDonald's has a requirement. Every 10 years, every single McDonald's has to change its appearance every 10 years. So it's not the same. Appearing McDonald's, even if they still have the same indoor dining, and they, they have the, but they have to change their appearance, and the, and the company obviously creates some things. But franchisees must do it. So if you don't get in the White Castle trap of having White Castles built in the 1920s, and then by the 1950s look old, decrepit, and, um, and dumps. Uh, and so McDonald's doesn't. And, um, and if there are problems, they actually buy out, buy out the problems, and rather than deal with them another way. And the company is very pragmatic. They take a look at what the problem is. And so, the other side to it is change is endemic within the food that they serve. And the food that they serve today has little to do with the food that they served even 20 years ago. So if you look at the menus that they're serving today and look at the menus what they're serving. And then they have great PR stunts. I mean, one stunt after another. Um, you know, you just got to sit back and marvel. Whether you like fast food or not, and want to complain about them, and you can look at them and say, "Oh, that's fascinating. How could they? Have, how could they have succeeded in doing some of the things that they did?" So, they, they, oh, they have been, man. And now by fast food, not McDonald's, but other fast food operations are now working in school, inside schools, not not just outside schools. And that's another problem with fast food that has been raised. Uh, uh, I mean, the goal of most fast food establishments now is to find a school, a high school in particular, and build one 
within a block or so of schools. And some uh, cities now have zoning laws which prevent that from happening. And the other part to it is uh, because many inner cities do not have a lot of food choices, many of them have targeted inner cities. And, and that's been an issue that's been raised. Um, so there's lots of problems with location. Location and locations have changed. But Aren't some of them operating in schools? Yes. Yeah. Yes. They're operating in schools. Yeah. No, they don't necessarily food serve. Service. They, no, they're the food service. Yeah, they, yeah, there is a food service, but they don't necessarily <laughs> serve the food that they serve in the restaurant. But they are off, they have the same connections with the same suppliers. They have the same connection, and and if they have a name up there. Schools part by the way, schools offer these. Um, uh, McDonald's night for teachers, uh, where everybody who goes, they give 50% of the profits for an evening to uh, the school, local school. I mean, you start taking a look at this, and less McDonald's and fast food, but uh, if you walk in high schools, they will have banners, and, and because the banners give huge amounts of sponsorship money for Coca Cola and for Pepsi Cola and for other products that target children, and you wonder should, should schools be advertising? Products uh, and the schools' responses, they need the money and the taxpayers need to pay for it. And so um, we, we'll do whatever way we, we have to in order to get the money. And the kids want to eat this. It's the nanny state that's trying to prevent you from having a good burger. Uh, so uh, we don't want the nanny state. We don't want government coming in and telling us what to eat and what not to eat. We want to keep the government out. We want to be able to sell our product and make a, make a profit so that we can be good community participants, and many of them do participate, good participation within the community, so it's not, it's, not, it's not the black and white that lots of people raise and do it now. But you were saying that, that ordinary uh, mom and pop, the private restaurants are, are no, no more nutritious than fast food places? Uh, study after study has been done of, of fast food operations, <laughs> comparing what they're serving like a burger with what's being served in this, and they found that the caloric intake, the salt intake, uh, and the sugar, not the burger, by the way, burgers do have sugar, but not as much, but it's higher in most local establishments. And so well, I'm better off going to McDonald's for hamburgers. <laughs> uh, you're better off making the food in your home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and buy, buy, buying the, the fruits and vegetables and doing it yourself from a, from a nutrition health standpoint, that's, that is what all the research indicates. But you can't, there are some good restaurants and, 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 and that serve good healthy food. And it's just that because they don't, right now, all, virtually all fast food chain operations will have the calorie content up there. You will know, or at least you can make, make choices if you choose to on calories. What research has found is that Americans who go into fast food establishments don't make choices based on calories. Uh, and so, um, at least, uh, Study after study has come back with that, uh, but uh, now they're trying to do, they're trying to get symbols rather than, you know, what, what does 400 calories mean? Do, do any of you know? I teach it. I don't know what it means. And so I, when I come back to it and say, it's very, it's not easy to understand. It's complex. And for most people, they're not there to, to worry about calories. They're there to get food quickly. They're there to get something cheap. They want to move fat out. And they want to, I mean, those are the things that, uh, that people are geared to do. And so. Uh, it's a problem of not understanding nutrition in general, and, and now I blame the school system. The school system should require every single student to have taken the help of it. When I was in, it was men took on motive, women took housekeeping, uh, and did except all 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 right. And then they made, but when they made, when they made those chocolate chip cookies, I wanted to be a part of that. <laughs> so, so, but but the answer is you need you need to have an and I don't know how many of you pay attention to. Nutrition studies. There's every day there's a negative nutrition study about something. I now want you to know eight cups of coffee and you will have 20% less chance of getting cancer. I may go into that. Uh, well, I, these were studies published in legitimate professional journals. They're, they're not ones run by the coffee industry. They, I mean, they're in Harvard. <laughs> uh, well, I won't get into Harvard. Harvard Harvard's got a problem uh, historically, but but. Uh, Harvard published all these. Uh, what the person who started the uh, home, uh, the, well, what be, what came from the studies department at Harvard, uh, looking at nutrition and whatnot. Uh, he was a big name man, 
he received millions of dollars from Coca-Cola and from other companies. And I know this will shock you. They had all these studies that came out of Harvard showing that the problem really wasn't sugar. Sugar is not a problem. It was fat. And so uh, I just want you to know fat was the real problem. And then, then Coca-Cola companies stupidly funded the Global Educational Balance Network uh, at universities. And I'm, I should be shocked, uh, but I'm not. Coca-Cola gave, gave unrestricted money to Harvard. They gave unrestricted money uh, to several uh, colleges and universities. Uh, and those colleges and universities just happened to do research that proved that what you really needed was not worrying about drinking Coca-Cola, but really was you needed to exercise. Now, I had my students work on the exercise part to it. One Coca-Cola with sugar in it, uh, you had to run two and a half miles in order to run off the calories that are contained in it. And I said, oh, no. so if you want to start working that out, you can go right ahead. I'll be able to run two and a half miles today. And the answer is no. So you started looking at these things. And, uh, and there are lots of problems with nutritional research, independent of where the funding comes from. Um, and so uh, it just seemed to me that Americans as a whole don't know much about nutrition and, or, or what they do know. They're confused. Not. They're totally confused where they choose. So you mentioned, you said that um, you know McDonald's doesn't see their growth in the U.S. anymore. No. Um, what do you see as the future of fast food? Will it, you know, given the trends, given, you know, supposedly we want to eat healthier, do you think they'll still be fast food and just be a different kind of food? Uh, there's, as I said, there's several really interesting things coming. Though. You think of fast food certainly started in what's the what, we, what I'm defining as fast food started in the United States and then expanded. But now there are companies that began in other countries that are now going into the United States. Nando's is coming in from South Africa. There are Japanese companies that are coming into the United States. There are, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, but it's not not talking about, but what's the other Mexican? Chipotle. Chipotle? No, no Chipotle is different. Like, what? No. The Vinho is Mexican. Del, Del Taco? No, not that one. No. <laughs> but there's nothing left. Del Taco. Something right El Pollo? El Pollo Taco. El, 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 El Loco Pollo. El Loco Pollo. Uh, that actually was a company that started in, in the Central America. And, and when it expanded, it came into uh, the United States and then it was bought out by an American company. So that's the other side. So there are companies, and there are several Canadian, Chinese uh, chain that began in Canada expanding into the United States. And so there are all sorts of things that are going on that uh, are. are Nothing that you would expect. Uh, and as I said, the fast food industry, uh, Philippines now has a, uh, uh, what's the name of the Philippine company that now operates in the South Africa like tonight? I'm getting old. I have all the information, I don't have access to it. <laughs> uh, but uh, there is a Philippine company that is the largest fast food operation in the Philippines, rapidly expanded first into Southeast Asia and then into the Middle East. The reason was because large numbers of Filipino workers go and work in the Middle East. And so consequently, um, uh, they did. That. They have now begun to operate. They've now got about 20 operations in Southern California. They, and they have one in Chicago. And they have one now, a couple in New York. And, and the answer is their target, again, is Filipino immigrant population. But they're expanding that and saying, now you can get real Filipino food, which is true. But that's what they're advertising for, by like going and getting fast food there. So I think one of the shifts and changes are, I think you're going to see a lot of diversity. The big companies, do I think you're going to have to, do you need another McDonald's in Philadelphia? Um, most of the McDonald's will say no, they don't want more here because they lose business. So the answer is you right, reach a saturation point. If you have areas that are expanding, that's something different. McDonald's has no plans to expand more than in a, uh, than what they're in the United States.